Okay. We are right now after three, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. And good afternoon and welcome to the December pre-planning planning commission meeting. That's always a mouthful. So um, we have what looks to be a healthy agenda on Monday. And we don't have any consent items. We do have two continuances. We're gonna turn this over to Gabrielle, but I assume it's similar in rationale to the last time. That they can take uh, the continuances in this case on um, the applicant just didn't have adequate time to resubmit um, by our deadline for the hearing. So um, she resubmitted a little bit later, later to address all of the conditions. So we'll bump her to next month. Okay, all right. The plat and the <clears throat> and and I actually um, miss looking at the planning commission deadline schedules. I don't think it was part of my package, but I can go online and look at it. Um, so let's talk about that now. Yeah, I didn't get. Can send those out. Yeah, you could you me? send it out in an email? Yeah. Would yeah, you? Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah send those okay. out. Um, so we actually have kept the same rhythm of our um, middle calendar as we have um, since the past year. We made some more substantive changes. I think it was last year going into this year, but we kept the same pattern. We're seeing it works a little better for us as staff to have some elongated periods between workshop and hearing and the applicants have a little longer to revise their plans and get them back to us. Um, so I think it, this this set of calendars um, has been a big improvement internally how things work for us. Um, we have that standard Standard track calendar and the extended track calendar. Um, the standard track is applying to applications like site plans, plats, um, smaller preliminary subdivision plats, whereas the extended track calendar is um, a bit longer. So the time it takes from the applicant to submit to finally get to you guys is, is longer. We have extra internal review built in for that process. And that's for um, annexations, master plans, large preliminary plats and site plans. Um, so we kept that same rhythm. Um, we tried to make sure we got all the holidays that the city is closed and observe those on there. Um, every every once in a while, we'll find something that we need to adjust, but it should be good for the entire year moving into 2024. Um, and then for your purposes, dates that you want to keep an eye on on that calendar are the workshop, the pre-PC, and the hearing dates. Everything else is kind of internal, so you don't need to commit those to memory or worry about those. Um, uh, they get to look at to understand what we're doing, um, but columns, uh, what is it, four, four, six, and seven on that chart are your, are where we need you, so. Okay, well, the one thing I love about these uh, virtual meetings is we can all see each other, so I'm just going to say, does anybody have any questions or comments on this one? Okay, okay, uh, April, when I say that, on these virtual, all you have to do is do that, and then I'll call on you. So, all righty. Um, <clears throat> so that takes us to um, the final site plan for for Black Hog, and this one is also you, Gabrielle. So, um, so since the workshop, uh, we did have our water and sewer line uh, exemption approved for APFO. Uh, so that's reflected in your staff report. Um, they also have integrated their lighting plan um, at the workshop. You may or may not recall, but the lighting plan was actually a separate exhibit. So they piled that into their plan. It's the same lighting plan that you saw previously, but now it's all part same set. Um, and then there is only one action that we need to take on this. There are no modifications. Um, and just a couple of technical conditions um, for notes on the plan. So nothing, nothing very substantive. Happy Alrighty. to answer any questions. Uh, anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, that looks nice and clean. So terrific. Um, <clears throat> next one is uh, Progress Court. And that is you, Gabrielle. Yes. And this one, um, they have updated since the workshop. Uh, there was discussion in your workshop summary about the landscaping required about around the dumpster enclosure. We require that all dumpster enclosures that are away from a building have year-round landscaping on three sides. So to screen that, um, the applicant had shifted their dumpster around a little bit through the internal review process and um, hadn't properly landscaped it where it landed in its final location. So they have done that now. 
um, in the staff report. I think we mentioned it at the workshop, but it wasn't part of your summary. Uh, we, we did include language about the 9% financial contribution that they have to make to the uh, signal at the intersection of Progress and Monocacy Boulevard. That was a requirement um, of the original subdivision, which all predated the adequate public facility ordinance. So before we had a formal APFO and we did um, you know, we have standards for adequacy. Uh, the the traffic analysis process was a little more fluid. Basically, they do a traffic impact study um, with what types of improvements were needed, and there wasn't the same kind of level of standard for specificity. It was a little more more negotiable. Um, so that requirement came out of that initial traffic impact study when the subdivision was done. Um, that this project was still looked at under the adequate public facilities ordinance uh, did, I believe, have an exemption because it didn't generate enough peak hour trips. But even though they're exempt, they still owe us that kind of legacy 9% contribution. So we have that in the staff report. And then uh, as a condition of approval, we're asking that they put a note on the plan that um, that indicates that um, and that it has to be paid prior to building permit issuance. Uh, that's often used just for good internal tracking. Um, that way when people get the building permit, they pull out the site plan, they look at the site plan and somebody goes, hey, look, they owe us this in case they don't um, necessarily offer it up right away. So that's an indicator for us. Um, and then, oh, I do want to make one note at the hearing because the applicant uh, sent me an email after they saw the staff report. The applicant has actually changed um, since the initial site plan was filed when i say the applicant i mean the owner of the property it'll still be the same civil engineer uh the new applicant is 8401 progress or llc um you have a different name on the first of your staff report uh it says that it's triple crown construction it is no longer them so i'll make a note of that monday just for the record um and once again, we only have the one action on this. There aren't any modifications um, and just a couple of uh, like notations and cleanup items, uh, two of them, three of them are from our city surveyor. And then that note I mentioned about the um, contribution. <laughs> Answer any okay. questions. And I do have to say, I really appreciate the summaries that you give us on these so that you mention everything that's happened since since the workshop and then you do a summary of the action so uh, anyway anybody have any questions or comments yeah. all right this is gabrielle is so thorough um <laughs> next one is the next two are oxford monocacy and these are with pam and pam is, pam is in jamaica um oh well lucky her lucky is she gonna be here on monday <laughs> Or uh, she will be back on Monday. She will um, hopefully be well rested and a little tan and feeling happy. Um, but so I'm going to cover these for her today. I'm in the Bloomfield one as well. So let me just make sure I'm on the right path. Um, here we go. So for the final site plan first. Um, this application, we spent a lot of time at the workshop and a lot of staff time um, focused on some of the access access issues. Um, we have provided an attachment in your packet since the workshop, um, which uh, two exhibits, which show how we want those access points uh, to be configured so that you have those exhibits and we can reference those as the conditions of approval. Um, the access issues uh, do relate to one of the modifications that you'll have to uh, vote on, which is a modification for the access separation standards. Uh, that is for the northernmost entrance as it relates to uh, one of the entrances into the Ren Quarter development, which is on the opposite side of the road. That's Brandywine Street, I believe is the name. Um, the access separation requirements for an arterial road. So we look at Monocacy Boulevard, that's an arterial road. And then the standards we apply are when we're measuring from what type of access point to another type of access point on that arterial. So we're looking at it um, as a uh, uh, access drive 
the distance between an access drive and a local street being the Brandywine Street on an arterial road. And the distance required, there's 400 feet. They've got about 296. Um, so we're requesting that modification. We did recommend approval of that. Uh, a lot of that is based on the uh, alterations to the access points that they've been able to, um, that they're going to comply with. Uh, there was also uh, the addition of the median to Minoxi Boulevard that they'll be constructing. Um, they're putting some um, trees in that, landscaping it. That will um, be maintained by the property owner. We will not maintain the trees within the median, uh, so they will need to execute a maintenance and access easement to, do, to be able to take care of those trees in the, in the public right of way. Um, related to landscaping, they do have a modification to the buffering requirements. Um, the buffering requirements are both for the level one and level two screening on the north and south property lines. Uh, the level one is the parking, or I'm sorry, the level one is the property line screening requirement, and the level two is when you have 10 parking spaces or more adjacent to a property that requires a, a bigger level two buffer. Um, the locations are both the same where they're requesting that level one and level two so they aren't able to meet um, either of those requirements in those two locations um, they have some retaining walls that they're constructing in order to grade the site that are making it um, feasible so we have that modification and then we also have a modification to the lighting spillover requirement um, the lighting is on other uh, non-residentially zoned property but they are requesting for some spillover there uh, the other action that is new from the workshop that will um, be having you vote on um, is a finding under our adequate public facilities ordinance of adequacy of a road that can't otherwise be brought up to the adequacy level standard because of physical constraints precluding that. So the APFO basically gives the planning commission, I think they even use the language of sole discretion, gives the planning the commission the ability to decide that there are constraints that would prevent an entire re redo of this road to bring about full adequacy standards. And you can make that finding provided that the applicant has, you've also found that the applicant has provided as much mitigation as possible, right? So a classic example, um, and this is situation's a little different, but I like to think of downtown, right? We have buildings that you're obviously not going to demo the intersection of East Patrick and East because you want to bring about road adequacy. You know there are buildings that preclude that from happening. So the goal is to get as much mitigation as possible, recognizing that there are improvements that can't be taken out. Uh, in this case, it is the improvements that were approved as part of the Gateway East Plaza development, which if you drive out on Monocacy Boulevard, um, there's the McDonald's under construction now, the Royal Farms with the big blow up chicken out front. Um, hopefully they'll get rid of that at some point. Um, but uh, the, there's the shared use path that's been constructed along that section. So uh, that is a decision point you'll also have to make. Um, that is very closely related to you reviewing the certificates of adequacy for roads, the, the certificate only one, um, which outlines the various financial contributions they're making um, that 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 is part of that ultimate mitigation. Um, they're contributing $43,598 to, um, to the CIP to widen Monocacy Boulevard between South and Sturridge, South Street and Storage Way. So it's staff's recommendation to you that the ultimate improvements are not possible to be constructed that would ultimately bring about adequacy because of the Gateway East Plaza development but uh, that that contribution that they're providing is um, the maximum that is is adequate um, to grant that certificate. And Cherry, and I don't know if you want to add anything there. Um, we've had a similar, I think, in the Highland Trail case, we, there was a similar request and finding for some of you may remember that was a master plan. And I feel like there was another case that it came up on um, that I couldn't remember when we were talking about this internally, but I can dig back through my mental file cabinet and see if I can come up with that. So there's that. And let me see if there's anything else in our conditions of approval. Um, most of them are technical. All pretty technical. 
comments. Um, on the forest conservation, talk about that real quickly. Um, they have initially, when the application first came in, they asked for a full fee in lieu of payment. We asked them to look for alternatives for landscaping credits. The version you saw at the workshop had landscape credit areas. We asked them to explore some further areas to get more credit. Um, they did. Unfortunately, they um, are looking for credit for areas that contain stormwater management, which we've told them they cannot do. So they're actually going to have to remove those, you know, that square footage from their overall landscape calculation. Um, but they have picked up additional credit for the street trees that they're going to plant in the um, median on Monoxy Boulevard. So they they have made gains, even though we'll ask them to take some out. Um, they have made some gains in terms of uh, trying to accommodate more um, landscape credit or tree credits so that their fee in lieu of has gone, has gone down. Um, but on the plan, on the conditions of approval, we'll be seeing a slightly different plan than you approve because they'll be extracting those stormwater areas out, recalculating their requirement. Um, and so the fee may change slightly. We've kind of estimated it in the staff report. And that's all I have on that one. <clears throat> Who has any questions? I do. Joan. Thank you. So I do remember the discussion of the road issues from Highland Trail. And in my mind, I have the, uh, the following explanation for basically the justification that we're saying that the roads are just going to get worse and the city thinks it's worth it because of this, these reasons. I mean, so essentially, we're saying that the road can't be, can't be made adequate. So we're going to, as a city, decide to live with inadequate road in that area because of this project. Um, the Highland Trails project, when we talked about it, I... There were several things that I that the city got out of that project that improved other aspects of roads in the area, and so it kind of made sense. What are we getting from this project that makes deteriorating the quality of that road and that intersection worth it? And, and if I can add on to that question so you can answer it, is this, I couldn't tell, is this a temporary inadequacy or is this after that whole center gets built up and all the construction leaves, will it still be inadequate? Uh, good afternoon, this is uh, Cherry. And um, yeah, I clearly remember all the discussion we had when Highland Trail, <laughs> Trail Thunder yeah. came through a couple of years back. I think, um, you know, the broader discussion is um, the amount of improvement. So specifically to your question, what exactly is uh, Oxford's providing? So if you read the APFO provisional road provisional certificate for um, uh, Oxford, they're, they're, they are contributing to several of the ongoing uh, projects that are either under design or planned for design and construction. So their co total contribution is about $636,000 to uh, road infrastructure. Um, that's the totality of the mitigation package. Uh, so how they will, um, they may be a phasing element to it, they, whether they build it all at the same time or they will phase. So over time, as they go, they will uh, provide these contributions to, to the question about the specific, um, uh, the finding, with respect to that one intersection, um, the 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 totality of the improvements that are along the I-70 corridor, um, there there are improvements along the corridor, 70 I-70 corridor that is happening. One big thing that happened over the last few years is the metal road in, interchange. Um, with the, everything that's going on in Oakdale, um, they've it, most recently the they uh, finally completed the metal road in interchange. So if you look at um, to the east of where that the 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 I-70 exit at um, Monocacy, there is no exit, I believe, for several miles. I forget exactly the next exit. So the metal road gave an opportunity for folks within that area to have another way to get in and out. So um, we are starting to see some relief to these um, interchanges specific to the, uh, that affect Monocacy East Patrick because of the new metal road interchange. Whether that's going to happen in the 
you know, immediately and within a year or two years, three years, as travel patterns change, we're not quite difficult to say, but um, what we have tried to do is look at a comprehensive plan and say, what are the level of improvements that we anticipate with monocacy? We look at monocacy for what is a filing road, and um, that's really where we are going to build and not build beyond it. So um, specific to Gateways Plaza, where this intersection is, they have provided as much improvements as as we can require along the frontage. So any improvements to further improve this intersection to make it operationally, which means that we'll have an impact on I-70. Even that portion of I-70 is is a um, what specific improvement is needed is a double left on to get on I-70 going west. But unfortunately, between that intersection and the bridge over I South Street, there is very limited space where you bring in two left turns and drop one lane and get every get traffic. So the state has to even push back and say, or, you know, there is really double left to pr improve that condition is is not a physically it's not physically possible. There is there are constraints to it. Um, keep in mind that we think that over a period of time, some of that traffic can shift to Meadow Road or other portions for the east um, because people have other opportunities to get on 70. We also think that um, because of the constraint here, people may decide to, okay, I'm not going to make a left here. I'm going to keep continuing on west on Monocacy. I'm going to go to East Street and get on the new interchange at uh, 85, uh, which has plenty of capacity. So um, the, the constraint today is that Monoxy Boulevard is not improved between Storage Way, Storage Way and South Street. And that's the city project that we just initiated the 100% design in our CIP. It's funded uh, for construction at FI25. So we think that by improving Monoxy, where it's that's the last piece of monoxy that needs improvement. By getting that improvement completed, gives a motorist an opportunity to bypass an intersection, continue along the same parallel to 70 to East Street and take 85. So I think, you know, I mean, yeah, today when you do the analysis, it's a really constrained, but I think once it's all built, the traffic pattern changing over the next three, four, five years. I think we will hit, hit the adequacy at that point. And to the fact that, the, you know, the comprehensive plan is a long vision <coughs> document. And I think the comprehensive plan builds into it. Other policy goals like reducing our VM vehicle miles traveled. And as such, we wanted to encourage people to use other <coughs> modes of travel. Um, so what else are we doing to promote other modes of travel. There is a shared use path that will be built along Monoxy Boulevard uh, all the way to E Street. So there are <laughs> other modes. We are supporting other modes of travel along the corridor. So uh, uh, that, and it's a long-winded answer. I'm trying to give you as much information as possible. If there, I'm more than happy to answer any other questions you may have. Um, so a follow-up to that is the um, the characteristics of o Oxford Monocacy unique to that applicant? <coughs> Sorry, that's making the problem, um, makes them not um, get an adequate certificate for roads or would any, <coughs> sorry, I have a throat tickle. <coughs> or would any, basically any applicant going into that property zoned as it is cause the same problem? Yes, and um, and and, and it, we it's not that we didn't know of that issue. Even going back to Highland Trail, we recognize that there is a constraint along the corridor, um, and we one of the other things we are working on. As you will start to see other applications, we have an application for over a million square feet of commercial next to the airport on Bowman Swan Road. Um, one of the things. I mean, we're, they also probably run into the same sort of issues in terms of road adequacy, but I think one of the things we are trying to work with state is to um, get a new uh, on off ramp and westbound I-70 at Airport Drive East. So there are certainly other things we're trying to work through to 
health mitigate that this is some are some can be handled at the city level some would need state highway to step up okay. again I mean, that's a big you know it's a five ten twenty million dollar project which city can cannot do so i think certainly need a state to um right but those things take a long time so i think to your question yeah the the, the corridor is really constrained we see a lot of development coming through uh but i think this is a, I mean, certainly, city have to hold hold up our end of the bargain in funding our infrastructure improvements. At the same time, we also have to look at other partners, like federal, federal and state partners, to um, help improve the situation. Great, thank you. Sure. So, so Cherry and, and I'm also going to have a follow up because um, I asked the second part. So, what I took away from what you said is. This is not a temporary inadequacy. And even when all the construction um, from the Royal Farm and all that, when all of that gets done, what's really needed is that second left turn lane. And for all the reasons that you stated, that is not going to be possible. I also heard though that there's other things that you all are working on including, I think I took this away, that you're gonna add like a second lane. Cause right now I gotta say, anytime I get in there, it's a mess, you know? Um, because there seems to be one through lane and one left turn lane. So it sounds like the city's gonna do, gonna expand that road, right? Correct. But, but there, at, it's not possible to add the second left turn lane, which is really what's needed to make that intersection, quote, adequate. Correct. For today, if you look at the numbers, I think, believe there's a, almost 800 left turns trying to get on from Monocacy to go west on I-70. Certainly, anything over 600 need double left. So certainly, the, 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 there are physical constraints, as I said, because you just can't drop a lane and move everybody to the through lane within that 1,500 feet before you hit the bridge, and that's really the constraint list. Um, to the second part of it, yeah, the city project will con design and construct a five-lane section of Monocacy with the left turn lane in each direction. Um, so you will have two through lanes in both directions. So that's the last remaining portion of Monocacy that need to be built, and that's where we're trying to get get the get it done. Okay, uh, and Gabrielle, you might say that this is not appropriate, but um, I, I, being a member of the Planning Commission, knowing that we keep approving projects in an area that a road is already inadequate, I'm slightly uncomfortable. So whatever information you guys can keep feeding us so that we can understand where the city is going, what the capital improvement projects are, what's out there in the future would 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 really help us rather than just saying, okay, it, it's the way it is. So, so. And that was really helpful, Cherry. Sure. While we're talking to Cherry and anybody else? Yeah. Ron. Um, uh, to your point there, uh, Barb, the uh, I'm I'm pretty sure we just um, approved um, two uh, buildings that are uh, transportation hubs um, at the corner of East and Monocacy. We're talking about another transfer facility uh, near the airport. I think it's on Hughes Ford or it, it might be another one of those roads. Uh, just interestingly enough, I pulled it up on uh, on Google Maps right now. And if you saw the red just now, I know it's a Friday afternoon. Um, now we're talking about adding um, a, another one. I, I just don't, from, I, I have this, this constant problem and I know we're not supposed to look at other projects. I just, I, I I have a problem with that because we keep doing this and now you're telling us the roads are inadequate and we're going to prove another one and make it more inadequate. And what's the timing on this that um, that these things are going to be remedied that I still have that big problem with uh, Hughes Ford Monocacy going to the airport. Um, I, I don't understand. I still don't understand why 
the the light went in for a, a, a residential project that's that's not even 20 percent occupied yet but we don't have one at this uh, dangerous intersection. And I'm pretty sure that at the airport, this is probably six months ago, we approved three, at least three, flex buildings going into that area too. So we're talking about this one project is inadequate and we're just, uh, to me, we're just exacerbating an in inadequate situation. Um, and at some point, we, we can't feel comfortable about continuing to do this with that. And, and yeah, I understand there's a lot of money that's involved in the, uh, the uh, extending uh, monocacy, and then there's physical constraints. We're not even talking about the sinkhole <laughs> that is exacerbating this whole thing. You know, at, one, at what point... Um, do we continue to approve things until we have a better timeline of when these things are going to be adequate again? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm supposed to respond to what Cheer said. I mean, certainly you're, you're stating frustration that we hear um, from uh, residents and others as well. I mean, I think from a, from a regulatory standpoint, I, I, I kind of put, the way I term it as we 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 sit in the regulatory box and try and do the best we can within that regulatory box because there are constraints built around what we can uh, legally be required an applicant to do. So certainly the nexus to a development and what we can get um, that developer to mitigate as far as specific to their impact uh, plays into it. So. Yeah, the cumulative impacts. I mean, certainly all, when when the traffic studies are done, they're looking at the cumulative impact of what other projects are doing on top of existing conditions. So that's really the end results we are testing as part of a traffic study. So all of that you mentioned are factored in that it's the, always the delivery of that infrastructure is the, the difficult part. And you know, one thing is that any developer probably is very hard to de deliver most of this in one day one. The other part of it is certainly the public has a responsibility and that's I'm saying public in the same the city. I mean, we we probably don't do a great job in funding our infrastructure. So I think that's really a gap that we need to kind of cover ourselves to say, hey, where are the demands and how how forward we can look at it and say when we need to fund these improvements and what is our um, financial ability as a city to fund these within a certain period of time. So there, there's um, what I'm trying to say is it's just really complex uh, uh, factors involved in it. The, we try and do the best we can and I think um, I'm confident that the, with the 100% the, the design we rolled out just now in the FY25 funding plan for monocacy improvements, uh, we probably in a position to deliver infrastructure in time for most of these get built and um, bring traffic into it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's specific to the REN that you mentioned, monocacy, Monroe. Um, yeah, the reason that the, the light they put in because again we were discussing mitigation agreements for that they five years back they anticipated they're developing in a different way than they actually built after four years so the so the mitigation agreement required them the way they anticipate the phasing would work that that's the first improvement they do but it didn't quite happen the way after four years and and so the, it lays out certain timing into it um yeah, I mean, it's, it's things that if we know uh, what happens in five years. I think we have a clear path to it, but we don't. And I think, I think I'm, I'm, I work for the city, but I think I said we need, a, from the city standpoint, need a better job in anticipating what ha will happen, where we need to put the money uh, into our infrastructure improvement. So I think we, we're always doing a better job, and I think we try and recognize where the needs are. That's why we're talking to state, state highway talking to fed, feds in terms of other needs because we see the need in another five years. 
Yeah, Charian, let me, let me be clear, Charian, because we've had this discussion a lot. Of, just no criticism of you at all. I, I know you're doing the best you can uh, with, with what you're dealing with, but when it comes to us and we're, and um, the individually, these developments um, have a lot of merit and we want to promote the infill development, both commercial, et cetera, but the, the, the problem that I'm having and, you know, may, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be approving these things until the infrastructure as it is at least planned to be able to accept this because the way I'm looking at it with the timing and we're talking about, we're, we're, I mean, we're talking about tractor trailers here. We're not talking about, and not to mention, if you look at the parking lot of this uh, property as well, um, I believe, um, I, I don't have it uh, right in front of me, but I believe there's at least 300 parking spots uh, for cars um, here as well. And now we're talking about this one corridor here that might have a structural problem of, of not being able, I mean, the two left turn lanes of being able to fix it from that. At what point do we as a planning commission say, hey, we can't approve this because our infrastructure is not being built fast enough to adequately, and that's exactly the word, adequately um, uh, have this traffic, especially tractor trailers we're talking about now. And we're talking about lots of them in one corner of the area that is we're saying right now is inadequate that, that I, I, as a group, you know, it, it, it's going to definitely factor into my decision of when we're going to start to approve these things or, or not approve them. Dorothy? Um, I'm trying to remember what I was going to say. So I was just curious, um, Charian, is there a way to possibly capture um, some of these individual improvements? Like, is there like a projected timeline for some of these improvements around that corridor that might help? Um, do you guys have like anything like a timetable or some kind of timeline? I was just curious about that. And you can share with us at least. Yes, we can certainly put together um, what else is going, what's going on at the area. Um, it, it one of the- help. It might help. Just so yeah. Yeah. Certainly, one of the things if you go out there today is the the really complex work of um, improving capacity at the Monocacy East Patrick Road intersection is very difficult work because it, they have to keep working when the tra keep the traffic going. Um, so it can only be done over phases over several months. Um, so th these are the challenges. Get into design is complicated. Um, we don't have all the, the utility information. They dig up and they find um, cables that goes to Camp David. So, <laughs> these are kind of the issues that um, <laughs> so we kind of encounter, which kind of runs into. So, but I think we can really certainly put together what else is going. And a lot of this is covered in the APFO certificate for roads, the, the set of improvements they will be contributing that kind of give you a picture of what is going on. As far as, as timing of delivery, as I said, it's very complex work and design. Um, sinkholes is another one we have to come up with, making sure that what we do doesn't make things worse, um, sometimes in water remediation, um, stormwater management. <coughs> um, so. Any estimate we give it will also be an, an estimate, just that, you know, you know, nothing guaranteed or the timing of development, like Ren was the biggest development five years back. We thought this is how rent's going to develop. It didn't happen that way. That's why you see some of the things that are some, some of the improvements are going to be delayed because they didn't hit the number of permits before they need to deliver something. So, um, yeah, let me stop it there. We can certainly put something an exhibit together to give you some idea. That okay. would be, and thank you for asking that. Oh, sure. sorry, Dorothy, you had a follow up question. Yeah, just real quickly. So I'm just curious. So what, you know, from a um, process standpoint, so what happens should we decide that we're not 
going to approve it? Just like, so what's the, what would be the next step for the applicant? Like what would happen exactly? I'm just curious about that. If you did not make a finding, so to Ron's question a little bit about, you know, um, should we keep approving these projects? This case is a little unique on um, this in Highland because you are um, empowered to make this decision about the adequacy. Other projects that we've had, the um, uh, uh, 550 Highland we had that had an exemption. Anything else that's gone through the APFO um, regulations and not subject to this provision, you really don't have a discretion over that at all. If, if we review the traffic impact study, we say this is a, what needs to bring about adequacy. It complies with everything. The Planning Commission doesn't really have a, a role in that decision. Um, so it would be difficult to deny a project that wasn't asking for a similar finding as this because it's applied with our APFO. Um, if the project, if, if the planning commission decide that in your sole discretion, you did not want to make that finding, um, then I'll get an um, absolutely definite answer. But I think what it basically um, is tantamount to is that you would then deny the site plan application. Because remember, one of your general site plan decision making criteria is that the, there's adequate infrastructure. Now, most of the time, if the pro project has gone through the adequate public facilities ordinance, if you agree or disagree with the, the approvals that have been granted, if they've complied fully with the adequate public facilities ordinance, it would be very hard to make a finding to deny the site plan on a lack of adequacy because we just went through your regulation and I, you know, I got, I got that approval. That is the barometer. So I think what you would have to do is not make a finding and then make a finding on the site plan application that, hey, look, one of my general duties is to ensure adequate infrastructure. I, I'm not. And my finding for that is that we don't find this to be adequate. And so they're, they haven't complied with the APFO. Um, and then the applicant would have the opportunity to appeal that decision to the circuit court. And just so any other file of a site plan. So Oh, oh, go ahead. Are you not done, Gabrielle? Okay. Uh, to follow up, uh, especially to what uh, Dorothy asked, um, and Sherry, and you may or may not know this now, I, <clears throat> I think I'm hearing it's very important to us to know what those projects are and the rough timeline of the projects. After the projects are completed that are currently being planned by the city, Sherry, and do you believe the road will then be adequate? Or at least, or you know, the intersection the would support the other, you know, <clears throat> traffic um, activities. If not, if that road is not 100% adequate. Yeah, that, that's a tough call to make because the traffic study that leads to um, determination of a failure is is based on projections and would. Um, something uh, were to not occur um, or um, a traffic pattern could be a little different than uh, than assumed in the traffic study. It, 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 it's a numbers driven and I think what, uh, I mean, as I said, the Meadow Road interchange opening, we haven't really realized what impact that will have at these intersections in the next two years. So, it, I mean, I, I, um, we can make some guess on it, um, but again, you know, I don't want to be playing with numbers uh, to make it work. Uh, end of the day, um, I can always present the best technical evaluation the traffic consultant and that had made uh, based on what is, uh, we can project into five years or three years or four years into the future. Um, to your question, with once the build out happens, things would be adequate. I mean, that's a really tough call to make because, um, you know, we would be approving other projects. As I said, we have one, a couple of things waiting in the wings for approval that's going to again contribute to this corridor. So it, it's a tough call to, I mean, that we, we're making this decision, um, picking a point in time. And if some were another project set to follow and will have the same impact would we continue to deny these projects um that's you know that's a different question but again i'm i'm, I'm the staff recommendation 
to the planning commission to make the finding is because we think there is a spe specific to this intersection there is no more improvements that can be made to to bring the Cindy in intersection to level of service D where it's where, where, where ultra threshold. And that's really where the difficulty in it. So and we can do all the different analysis, but the fact is even if the, if the applicant has to mediate, really, as I said, it's a double left and just cannot do that improvement. Okay, so, so stop right there. Um... Is it the matter of money? So when I first heard you say there was no more improvements, I'm thinking, well, money's not an issue. If there's just right now, there are no more improvements that can be done. But then I sort of took away is there's no more imp improvements that we can reasonably ask the applicant to take on and pay for. Is that what you mean? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just specific to this intersection. There are physical constraints that um, right. that prevent from additional capacity and, and the way we want to look at it is um, what if there is no double left that would say help with the uh, the capacity constraints so as a, I'm just playing out a scenario where a driver comes and said hey, okay I can't make this left but I can get the same service if I continue to go on Monocacy to East Street make a left to 85 and get go you know get to the interchange and go west on I-70. So that's the alternate that we're working to right while recognizing the constraint that we have here at uh, Monocacy uh, on off ramp. Okay, so it's not. I I just wanted to be really clear about this. This is not an issue of money or an issue of not wanting to give more to the applicant to pay for. This is an issue of there's no other thing that can be done at this time. Is that what you're saying? Correct. And 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 in response to that, the applicant is making a contribution to the city's project to widen Monoxy Boulevard. That's a mitigation <laughs> they offer rather than working on an un unfeasible solution <laughs> or infeasible solution. Aaron. Yeah, and I wanted to go back to what Gabrielle said. Oh, Gabrielle, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say, um, you know, I, I, it's a good conversation, and I don't want to. I want everyone to be well informed to think about this and talk about it more Monday night. Um, but you know, I think a lot of to what I'm hearing is, um, you know, an opportunity. We we look at the CIP every year, right? And we're we're always looking for opportunities. I mean, I think this kind of conversation. This is a, a bigger kind of more global um localized but global issue that you know when we I, I want these thoughts are so important to that cip discussion and to continuing to have i mean they're important to this project but um as we look more broadly and you make your recommendation to the mayor and board about hey where we see the development wanting to happen if we want to continue to grow this is where we need to come to the table and and be investing our dollars. Um, so uh, just just a plug for when we get to the CIP conversation, yeah. I think it, this is really important. This is a good conversation. I couldn't agree with you more. And I'll, I'll just make one little side thing here. Um, I Hearing a million square feet of commercial property come up sort of puts an alarm in my head. I know retail actually causes a lot more traffic than residential. Yeah. And that has been, that was an issue that we were dealing with, with downtown Columbia. So if there's a, and a million square feet is like a mall, that's a regional mall. So if there's a regional mall of retail going, I, I would really want to understand um, when that hits us. And I'm just giving you guys a head up, a heads up, that whole thing about the timeline and the mitigation that's coming down the pike, et cetera. I, and if it's going to be commercial retail or commercial office, because that's a big difference. So, um, so Gabrielle, I just wanted to follow up with you in regards to your comment on my previous question, and maybe I'll state my question a different way just to make sure that I'm clear. So with action four, um, if you're fine, if you, it'd be difficult to have a finding of, of not finding um, a finding of adequacy if you have um, the, uh, an approved APFO. Is that what you're saying? And then therefore, if you couldn't find um, road adequacy finding for action four, then you couldn't do action five. 
Is that what I'm hearing you say? I think so. Um, so in we've, we've done the APFO analysis. We've made recommendations about what would bring about adequacy. And that's that's to the sole discretion of, of Cheering and the, the city engineer, uh, the director of public works, um, to, to identify what mitigation measures would bring about adequacy. But that is all predicated on the planning commission making that finding that even though there is inadequacy, we're going to find it adequate because in those two findings that are important, there are constraints that preclude an, an improvement that would bring about adequacy. We can't physically do it. And the applicant has provided as much mitigation as possible. As possible. Um, if, if the planning commission did not said no we don't we don't think the applicant is providing as much mitigation as possible or no we don't think that there's an actual physical constraint they can make an improvement that's adequate if you had some basis to deny that finding of adequacy then i would say that without that the planning commission would be well poised to not approve the final site plan under your general authority for a final site plan which part of it is to find adequacy Make sense? Yes. Thank you. That was very helpful. Uh, okay. Um, I actually have a few other questions on this. Does anybody else have other questions? Most of it. The first one is just, um, I remember reading this at the workshop and I, I read it a couple times here and I'm just um, on page five. I just want to make sure I get this. <clears throat> Second paragraph, last sentence, it said, um, however, there were on-site and off-site access circulation concerns that specifically if a tractor trailer were to travel south, leaving the site. So travel south means they come from the north and you already got that taken care. Of. So I just want, want to make sure I understand what you mean by that exactly. We're to travel south leaving the site. Um, anyway. Go ahead, Sherry, I'll, I'll let you if you want. Yeah, it's, it's, so initially when the applicant submitted the, uh, the application, the, the northern entrance, if you recall, the northern entrance was designed as a right in, right out. So right. if, um, which meant that um, to enter the site, the tractor trail is primarily using the northern entrance. They have to come from I-70 sides from, um, with the tech, I'm just gener generically calling it south, from the I-70 side, because they would come from I-70, come up on Monocacy and make a right into, so, you know, everything is fine. Um, and if they, the, these, these tractor trailers have to leave the site, then they have to make a right, um, go up on Monocacy towards 26 or US-15, that, or they make a U-turn somewhere if they can. So the, we figured that that is a constraint on the site because the, the main entrance they have could not support the tractor trailer traffic because the, the, the curves, the corner radii and all were not friendly to tr the tractor trail turning in, um, which meant that th they were very constrained on this side in terms of how the, the tractor trails were. So if a uh, tractor trail had to go south, th there was no way for them to circulate through the property to that main entrance. Um, so what the, I get, the, yeah, I get that that one, but the other way they can still turn into that entrance. So how does this, how does the change here, adding the median, handle the traffic coming from the south and heading north? They could still go in that entrance, the main entrance. The, the tractor trailers cannot go into the main entrance because there is no way for them to circulate through the parking lot to get to the back of it. They will have to that use that northern entrance. So, we've 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 uh, through the design change provided more flexibility in the tractor trailer entering the site. So, if you if a tractor trailer is coming from the north, they can use the new break in the median to make a left into the site. The same thing if they're coming from the south, they can enter the um, site with the right turn. 
leaving the site, they are now constrained to only make a right out because they cannot, I mean, none of the tractor trailers can navigate through the main parking lot. The, those are very constrained um, uh, to accommodate uh, the tractor trail traffic. I don't, I, again, I'm not sure if I, I, okay. I'm explaining it. Um, I just, um, I think so. There were, so <clears throat> I think you did. So, so at this point, I'm hearing, and it makes sense, that the tractor trailers leaving the site can only make a right out of the northern um, access point. Entering the site, though, and and we talked about this at workshop with all the, you know, the example was all the trucks that are using GPS, it might be the first time here. And I know that the owner said there was probably only 10 trucks and they're accustomed to coming here, but still that keeps happening at that low bridge on their way to Costco. Uh, and I suggested that the owner actually put a, one of those bars to stop the track, the trucks from entering the entrance at the main level at the main entrance. But it sounds like there actually hasn't been done. There's no changes to stop tractor trailers from entering there, they're gonna find out once they enter that they can't navigate through, right? If in fact they enter, that's oh, at entrance. the main entrance, correct. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, we do have those, I mean, Aldi has, like for example, Aldi has a sign which says trucks, truck entrance. And I, I think, I'm, I mean, if as an additional signage would help, I mean, certainly something they can add to um, say this is how the trucks enter. And again, of all the num, they, I mean, I think the truck traffic is very low. But I mean, certainly if they're working with repeat um, haulers, um, they, they, you know, they probably do it once. And, but certainly there could be other signage if needed to kind of direct uh, commercial traffic or the trailer traffic to the northern entrance. Um, I'll ask my question on Monday then, because I, okay. I don't understand why we can't ask the applicant to put that bar up when we did it at sure. another similar project. Um, it just, if there's a chance for somebody to not look at the signage and not pay attention, a first time driver, it it is gonna happen. So, Gabrielle, you're thinking? Or No, I, I, um, you're on me. What? <laughs> um, you know, our focus primarily, and I'm not saying that good design shouldn't be pursued in all cases, but, you know, we want to make sure we're thinking about the, the public infrastructure. You know, once the truck is on their site, that is not, at least we don't want to be concerned about public infrastructure being damaged or deteriorated. It is the applicant's private responsibility to make sure that they're maintaining their their site in a way that works best for their operations. So, um, but I, I, I don't disagree that. I, I'm just thinking of design. trucks trying to back out onto yeah, Monocacy. That was where my brain is going. So, all right. Any, anything else? Just one quick question. The power line that's across um, the project, where is it gonna be moved to? It says it's gonna be moved, but it didn't say where. Do we know where? They do have to relocate some of the utilities. I'm not sure on that. That would be a good question to ask. Um, they probably working with the utility company and try to understand that themselves. So I'll ask them Monday night. Thank you. All right. That was a long one, but important. Um, and all right. We go to Bloomfields. And that's also yeah. Pam, so that means it's Gabrielle. And Pam. this is a, a large plan. Um, you know, the the good thing about large plans that are predicated by master plans um, is that a lot of the design standards for the lot details um, are things that we're, we're basically plugging and playing into now the, the land use layout. So of the big decisions were made with the master plan in terms of lot setbacks and all those sorts of things. And now it's just placing those units um, on a street network and, and organizing that that um, hierarchy of streets and and um, homes on that. Um, so let's see, since the Planning Commission workshop. We haven't had 
ton of updates on this. Um, we did at the workshop talk about um, the private path system. We had some recommendations um, that we thought would be a little more straight, um, straight and narrow. Um, the applicant is designing these are these are path systems that are not part of our shared use path they're not designed um with transportation in mind as well as recreation they're their internal private path system um the applicant likes what they have um our recommendations were um like i said not related to public infrastructure so they've left them as they've left them as they had on the workshop um and we don't have any further recommendations on that at this point um so that has not changed um we do have the one modification for access separation um just like we talked about in the uh, previous case the access separation is when we're looking at distance between two access points on whatever type of road it is luckily these are all the local roads internal um so the separation um is not um you know, it doesn't potentially have the same impacts on major infrastructure like arterial roads um so but there are a handful of locations where the the residential streets do not meet the minimum separation requirement um let's see in terms of our conditions i think most of them are pretty technical there is a requirement that the applicant does have to return to the mayor and board of aldermen for approval of um, forest conservation within land that they're dedicating to the city for public park land uh they've already gotten approval for some, but they need to um, reflect this plan and actually the previous, I think, section two. So after the planning commission takes action on it, it would go to the mayor and board for us to be willing to accept parkland that will be encumbered by a forest conservation easement. Um, and then the only other kind of point of interest on the um, conditions, I think, is related to uh, the, prod the lot that is a county lot that's kind of is surrounded by this project. Uh, the at the workshop we noted that the applicant needed to either decide whether they were going to grant a fee simple access to the lot meaning they would be giving it um, uh, actual land to add to it so the project had direct frontage on the road or if it would be an easement um, the applicant has still been contacting with the uh, that property owner so we've left it a little open-ended to say you know either either they need to come to an agreement to have that land actually fee simple added or um, grant the easement and negotiate that with the uh, adjacent property owner there so that's that last condition you'll see otherwise i believe it was pretty pretty straightforward any questions okay i think we're good on that one all right um takes us to dk dnk i believe yes dnk and there are two items for this one yes so for um let's see for the site plan the um the applicant did go back there was a question that was raised at workshop about being able, the applicant being able to provide taller trees to the rear of the lot next to um, Route 26. So the applicant did go back and revise that to provide for taller trees in, in the landscape plan. Um, and then for this, there are um, just the, let's see, I was just looking back at this. There are three modifications um, one is for the loading space. Um, the other one is uh, light over spill or spillover. Um, and then the third one is the level one buffer in the rear yard. They wanted to to modify that. So that's all I have. There really wasn't much else to update on that one. Um, the forest plan, go back and pull that one up. Um, let's see. I think. Yeah, there really wasn't any update on that one. So they're good to go. Um, there are no, um, there are no conditions of approval for that one. So. Okay. Any questions from any commissioners? All right. I think we're good. Okay. Thank you, Sherry. Um, 
And the next one is Sherry's two, and this is the Barrick property. Yes, yeah, so this one also has three modifications. This is the one um, where they're asking for different modifications for the single family as well as it, they're proposing yard and setback requirements um, for the multifamily in the townhouse standard since there are none in the R4. So that is all in there. Um, let's see, I'm just trying to think if there was anything that came up for, from workshop. Um, I think, yeah, I think that was, it for that one, you know, they're exempt from the APFO um, because none of the utilities like water, sewer, and roads, um, none of those increased in intensity or density. So um, they were able to get the approval for the APFO exemption. And, 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 on, and on page five, they answered the question that Commissioner Strassen had. Yeah. Now let me go back to that one. Oops so many pages uh yeah i think yeah i believe they did so um that was it for that one um and if you have any questions on that any questions yeah. i think we don't have any questions and this is the first of two required hearings yes yeah, so there's so, no recommendation at so this point if April, what that means is that we will be hearing it again next month and the vote will be taken next month. And both months we go through basically the same process and we ask for public comment in both of the hearings. Okay. All right. And um, that takes us to our last item. And this is the zoning map amendment for the historic preservation overlay. Oh, hello, Christina. Hello, I'm here. So um, no updates to this zoning map amendment, but uh, with the staff report missing from the workshop uh, meeting, I wanted to make sure I was available with, to, to answer any questions after uh, you were able to read and digest that, that documentation. Did anybody have any questions? Yes, I know I did. Um, so I was just curious about, and I'm looking at, and I'm this doesn't have a number, but I'm looking at okay. the proposed HPO boundary. This is what it looks like. Do you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. I was just curious that green. Um, so that would be the proposed overlay, correct? Is that what that would be? And, that is and that would be right next to 1702 Atlas Drive. Yes, the, the green line that you see, that's the, the property boundary. That's our, our typical standard is to, to follow the property boundary of, of the subject building. Okay. Um, that's the property boundary and it's also going to be the overlay, correct? Correct, right. yes. So my question is, um, that 1702, I'm just curious, that would be considered a residential property right next to it, is that correct? Yes, and, and this would still also be a residential property as well. That, that, that base zoning, of course, wouldn't change. Okay. I guess where I'm thinking in my head is this, this boundary and overlay, I guess, is on the side of 1702 and somewhat, I think that would have been considered, what, what, considered the back or the front of 1702. So if someone lived in that property, would they have to go through the HPC to get any improvements made and that was my question because it seems like that green is um butting up against that 1702 so i was just curious about that yeah very good question so this would have no implications or, or design requirements for any neighboring properties even if they put a fence right up against the property line of course it wouldn't trigger any kind of hpc review so they're completely exempt from the hpo okay thank you that was my main question i was curious about that. <laughs> no, thank you um, and then I guess one last question I have is on page two, bottom of page two. Um, and I was just getting a clarification. So with the criteria for designation number three, 
um, and I think there's four of A through D, is meeting one of the four criteria, or is that um, you need to meet all of the four criteria? Just one. Just, just one. Just one yeah. of the four. In number three from A through D. That that's correct, and and well, so it it will be either it has to be fifty years of age of older, it has to retain its integrity, um, and it needs to retain either A, B, C, or one of the items in D. Okay, but not all of them. Not all of them. Gotcha. Thank you. That was it. Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you for reminding us of that. Uh, anything else on this one? Um, I have a question. Um, and the, the, my concern here is um, we, we apply this. I seem to remember the owner of this property is not supportive of this application. Um, who owns and who maintains this building um, going forward? So the property owner, just like any property owner in the history, like the downtown historic district, is is responsible for um, ownership and and taking care of the property. Um, I am a little personally a little confused by the um, the, the property owner. Um, he he did provide some documentation ex expressing some concerns, but at the same time he he he. Maryland Historic Trust did reach out to me this week, and he did apply for um, funding, but that funding would only be available if this HPA was applied. And so, you know, it's, so I there, guess he's applying in case. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so um, they they reached out confused um, about that. And they're waiting for us or wait for, waiting for me to give them whatever the result of this process is. So uh, they can yeah, make their well, own determination. They're, they're not alone in being confused because I am too. Um, so okay. the, it, it just seems to me, I, I hate to see that we approve this and then it just becomes demolition through neglect where, I mean, yeah. if you look at it now, um, it, 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 it doesn't look like there would be a lot more time of, you know, uh, I, I know, I think you mentioned at the workshop that um, they're required to do a certain amount, you know, the boarding up and, um, but, you know, how long does that last? Um, uh, I just don't know that we're, we're, we're putting a Band-Aid on something that is a, a, a mortal wound. I, I do get that concern. Um, I, I will say that, you know, although this property isn't designated yet, um, the the reason why we, so we had this plan of, you know, we were going to start the designation process with the developer still owning this property. Uh, he was supposed to relocate the building and let us know when all the relocation requirements were met so we could close out that permit. When that permit was closed down, or closed out rather, we were going to start the redesignation process. I talked to this new property owner before he purchased the property um, to tell him more about, you know, this unique situation that this property is going to be relocated. This before it was moved, that it was going to be relocated and that the city would have to reapply the HPO and then there would be a design review process. So he knew before he purchased that this was going to be it. Um, Right now, of course, there is no HPO, but he reached out informing us that the property transferred and he was getting ready to do work. So I don't think this is a, a property that he invested in to not repair. Um, so he went. Ahead, he's already received permits to put in a new driveway, new roof. He's already, you know, applied to the Maryland Historic Trust to do more rehabilitation work. So I really do think that the intent is to repair this building and. If he's trying to get these tax credits, he's trying to follow the same standards that the city wants to apply. Um, but he can't get the funding for that until we get this overlay applied or, or make a determination on that. Do you think we can get the owner uh, to the meeting on, on Monday? 
So he is certainly aware of it. I sent him the agenda and he has access to the staff report. Um, so I, I, don't, I do not know if he, he plans to attend. I always I kind of expect to see him at these meetings and, and I'm surprised he hasn't, but. Okay. All right, thank you. That's all I have. Yeah. Anything else? It says five minutes left in our meeting. That's odd. Is the meeting only to... till 420? <laughs> I, I, I don't even know what time we've got all, all day. No, it's a, I, <laughs> I did want to make one note. Um, January, uh, per rules or procedures, it's election season. So we need to vote um, our members of the planning commission, um, our chair, vice chair, secretary. Um, so just something to keep in mind for the January hearing. We don't need to do anything with it this month. Um, but okay. just wanted to throw that out there. That sounds great. Um, anything else from anyone? Just real quickly, Gabrielle, when will we see the CIP stuff? Like, when will that show up? Yeah, was, that um, I was around surprised. December last year, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm surprised I haven't gotten um, uh, Zach's office, Don Holden. She's wonderful. She's um, she's his right hand man. She always sends me that reminder, like right around this time of year. So I'm surprised I haven't seen it yet. If she's watching, um, I know it's out there. So I know I will start looking um, and pulling that into information together. We try to do it in the February March time frame. Um, I think is the latest we want to push it. So, right. When is it approved? When is the uh, budget approved again by the mayor and board? Is that like in like April or May or something? Or June, yeah. Um, <laughs> so they will get it. Um, let's see. Um, I think that. Here we go. Yeah, they have all their budget meetings throughout May. Uh, the beginning of the fiscal year is July. Um, so May is the um, Board of Aldermen of the budget and the property tax rate. So, uh -huh. and the CIP is all part of that budget. And a, and a follow-up to the CIP, um, I have to pull out the email, but I know that Dorothy recommended a process and a spreadsheet that was a pretty valuable process and gave some context to the planning commission. So uh, I'm going to ask if um, that can be incorporated in what we actually receive as far as the CIP goes, as far as the um, staff report. The project. Yeah, well, if you want to send, resend it to you, if you like. I have it. If I don't find it, I'll let you know. But I'm oh, I'm okay. almost positive I should be able to retrieve it. Okay. Oh, there's um, just one quick note on the CIP. Sometimes because these are complex projects and the delivery could be down you know down the line. You may not necessarily see something in the CIP, but if you and I think you've um, asked for uh, an update on all these planning efforts that that goes on in the background. I think it's a useful information for planning commission help make these decisions or at least what goes on in the background because we're dealing with a lot of stuff that we're trying to deliver. Uh, we want to do it all that you know last year, but the fact is that it takes. We have to. I mean, I have things that I want to do in ten five years that I'm keeping in my head, but um, certainly it will be a useful exercise for you all to understand where. Uh, the needs are and how we respond, not just from building roads, but other infrastructure, transit, uh, sidewalks at a very basic level, um, bike paths, shared use paths, uh, protected bike lane infrastructure. Again, we need to think more holistically about transportation, not just, you know, can I drive from here to there? Um, so it's really a big challenge and, and I think um, Hopefully we'll get that exercise maybe between now and the CIP rolls done, rolls out, so you have a little better understanding as to how we think infrastructure. Yeah, and uh, towards that end, uh, Chairman, because if you if you had told me that um, Camp David wiring was going to impact Patrick Street and uh, Monocacy, I never would have believed that. But you know, <laughs> th these are the things that we don't. We really don't know about and and unfortunately you have to deal with all the time um but just i know uh, part of the discussion um uh last year when it came to the cip and i think it's it's something that um we we should um request again i don't know what happened with the request um 
but uh, a, a smart traffic analysis um, for the entire city of Frederick. So, uh, you know, there's all, all this technology now for, uh, you know, embedding um, sensors in the streets uh, to time the lights better. Um, you know, I, I, the, the inconsistency with, uh, in just my driving around town of, you know, how many red lights I hit um, on, a, on a particular path and how consistent it is. Um, I could just give a, a real simple example. Making a, if if I'm if I'm going south on Market, I'm sorry, was someone talking? Oh, uh, if I'm going south on Market and I make a, a left onto Monocacy near uh, Costco, I hit I hit the red light at Monocacy. I hit the red light at Costco. I hit the red light at. Um, um, uh, I guess it's, uh, Urbana or, or that's oh. E street. Um, and I, I, I just know there's that technology and I think the city should really invest in looking at that, especially with the, the types of development that we're approving here. Um, you know, think of the bowling alley project and all those other developments, et cetera. Um, you know, just putting the sensors in the street and, and making that more automated. I think that's something that should be in the CIP and uh, a request of ours. Certainly, yeah. Um, yeah, end of the day, I think it's, it's just always um, personnel and and funding. I mean, that's only, sure. you know, we, we have a constrained capacity in-house too. Sure. Well, thanks. I mean, it's great suggestions and hopefully the, 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 the recommendation because you end up approving projects and that I think the delivery is important and operations are important. So I think any feedback you can give uh, will be great. Great. It still says five minutes left in your meeting. So are, are there been any saying that for the last hour, actually. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Ron. I just noticed it. So uh, <clears throat> you can see how. Um, I think we were supposed how, to end at four o'clock. Thing I oh. <laughs> well, technically, I thought this meeting was three to five, but uh, we generally don't go past four. Um, anything else? Feel better, Barb. Okay. Well, well, well thank you. And um, I may see you all on Monday, and um, I'll send that email out, and you'll know what I'm talking about, Joan, when you get my email. Okay. Thank you all. Have a good, good weekend. Oh, the meetings are just